When I got divorced, I was so sick and tired of that situation. I hung in there for five years trying to make that thing work because I was never going to get divorced. And then when I was ready to pull the trigger, I didn't have a handgun. I had a bazooka, you know. Bazooka. Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And for those of you on Facebook who are joining us, we are going to be restoring our Facebook lives. Watch out for more. Today's topic is when should I get divorced? And really what the question we're answering is it's what time is it? It's October, late October as we do this particular presentation. And a lot of people find as they're rolling into the holidays, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, there are people who are frustrated in their marriage, they're unhappy in their marriage, they are suffering in their marriage. It is excruciating, the fighting, or maybe they're avoiding fights. Maybe what's excruciating is keeping it all in, pretending everything's all okay and everything's good. Maybe what's excruciating is trying to hide all this from the kids. Maybe what's excruciating is it's interfering with so many things that are important to you and it keeps going on and on and yet you don't want to pull a trigger. Why don't you want to pull the trigger? There's lots of reasons why we don't want to pull the trigger. One might be, I've heard a rumor that human beings are a little resistant to change. Another might be, we were just talking about the holidays are coming. Do I really want to put my kids and my family through that during the holidays? The holidays are supposed to be a celebration of family. Why would I pull the trigger now? Maybe I should wait till January. Another, another reason might be, you know, this is going to impact a lot of people, besides me, besides my kids even. And it would just be better for everyone and less stressful and less frustrating if I put it off a little while. Another reason might be we don't know what divorce entails. And until we have the information, we're not going to pull the trigger. These are all, if, this were, if I were selling you on getting divorced, these would be called objections to getting divorced. But really what they are is considerations. Let's be straight. And they're major and they're serious considerations, by the way. I am not diminishing them. I mean, on the one hand, divorce can take from six months to 10 years. I've heard, I heard, met one guy who had a 10 year long divorce. Can you imagine that going through 10 years of divorce? How many holidays did he go through getting divorced? In his case, if he waited until January, did it really make that much of a difference? Hard to say. I think, though, optimally, we all want our divorce to be as short as possible. And here at Rich in Relationship, we specialize at helping people to have the shortest, least painful divorce possible. And what that means is, if you're going for, aiming for, the shortest, least painful, expensive, emotionally, least costly financial divorce possible, then when becomes a real question versus a 10-year divorce. So let's say it's a goal. We want to have the least expensive, least emotionally stressful divorce possible. What are some of the things that need to be in place for that? Let's say that we want to have a divorce and we want it to minimally impact the other facets of our life. Not that it isn't going to impact, because let's get real. A major change like this, divorce is one of the top three stressors. The first is the death of a loved one. The second, I believe, is moving. And the third is divorce. And what they don't account for in that is that inevitably, when people get divorced, they end up moving. So you actually, I think if you put those two things together, it might be death of a loved one. So it's very stressful and it's going to impact everything we do. It's not that divorce isn't going to impact our kids and our loved ones. I mean, God, it's going to turn their world upside down. It's not that we're going to totally resist change endlessly. Because let's face it, how long can we hang out in this painful, excruciating relationship? How long are we going to bear it? So we're going to explore each one of these things. Let's start with basic resistance to change. As human beings, 
particularly when we have children, we are programmed to nest. We are programmed to create regularity and systems. And the reason is that when we're nesting, when we have children, we're creating safety and regularity for them. We've worked together, each of us leaning into our individual strengths to create the most regular and systematic and safe environment for our children as we possibly can. Now, how successful we've been at that or not might be one of the reasons why we're getting divorced, by the way. So maybe your systems aren't what they could be. Maybe you don't work well that well together. Maybe that's part of the problem. But the reason why we're resistant to change is because children demand, need regularity and boundaries. And getting divorced means turning all of that upside down. Individually, we tend to pace our lives with our own disciplines, our own systems, our own way of doing things. We go to work on set in certain days. We go to bed at certain times. We eat certain things. We wear certain clothes. Big break for me today. I didn't wear purple, which is the brand. Although this might show up as purple. You never know. We have things that are regular in our life, and we resist change because those things make us feel safe. There's an ch inner child in each one of us that wants to feel safe. And at the same time, what's the one constant in life? Change. And the question is, are we going to be reactive to change, or are we going to be proactive to change? When we're reactive, things are happening to us. When we're reactive, we often feel like victims. When we're reactive, we're often blaming other people. When we're reactive, we are, if we were fighting, we'd be back on our heels, right? And you're never supposed to be back on your heels when you're fighting. You're supposed to be on your toes so that you can move forward. If you're back on your heels, or when we're reacting, to, let me give you a metaphor that's more relatable. If you ski, which way are you supposed to ski down the hill? A lot of times when people ski down the hill, they find themselves leaning back because they're afraid of falling forward, but that's a reaction. But if you're going to be proactive as a skier, you lean forward. You lean into it because it gives you more control over the skis, whether the weight is on the front of the ski, and because when you lean into it, you're embracing the future. So the question is, are you going to be proactive or reactive about your life? And I think the answer is obvious, right? Like, we all... Ideally, in here, in our intellect, we want to minimize reaction and maximize proactivity, whatever that looks like for us, without eliminating the desire for a little spontaneity, right? If we're too programmed and too proactive, we lose spontaneity. So the, I'm suggesting to you that divorce is a big change, and you want to walk into it being pro and to be proactive, you need to do what we're doing right now. You need to go through all the different areas that influence divorce so that you can make your decision. Otherwise, you can shoot from the hip and say, F this. This stinks. I'm divorcing you. And just not only me blow them up, but you're going to have a really angry, painful divorce that's filled with reaction. And your kids are gonna suffer more and you're gonna suffer more and they're gonna suffer more. And here's the bad news. If you have kids together, you know what happens when a divorce is over? You're still together. You're just living in separate domiciles, managing these kids, but you still need to work on it together. And I can tell you, you know, from working as a parent coordinator with people who are having a hard time post-divorce working together and from working as a divorce coach, for people who really want to have an effective relationship with the other person when they get divorced, that the closer you are when it comes to the kids and their well-being, the better off your kids are going to be, and therefore the better off the two of you are going to be. And so you want to be proactive in this. You don't want to just shoot from the hip and say, I hate your guts, bam. Even though you may feel that way, even though that may live for you. And I want you to know when I got divorced, this was a big deal for me. When I got divorced, I was so sick and tired of that situation. I hung in there for five years trying to make that thing work because I was never going to get divorced. And then when I was ready to pull the trigger, I didn't have a handgun. I had a bazooka, you know, bazooka shoulder loaded. Maybe it was a shoulder loaded missile launcher. I don't know. You know, I don't, I, I never served in the military. It's just the stuff I've seen on television. 
but um, I was I was armed for bear. And thank God, somebody came along. I met someone uh, at a college reunion who knew all about divorce, and that person coached me through the divorce process. She told she taught me how to put down my bazooka. She taught me how to think about my children. She taught me how to be proactive instead of reactive. She taught me how to think about I was going to respond to all the things that were going to come at me. And she knew what was going to come at me in a way that I didn't because she had coached so many people through the process. And that's the value of having someone who knows the mountain. You know, when you're climbing the mountain, when you're climbing Mount Everest, you don't do it alone. You do it with someone who's been there before. Makes sense, right? They know the way up, they know the places to rest, they know the weather, they know all the signs of inclement weather. If you want somebody who's going up the mountain with you who's been there. All right, so being proactive means that you're gonna, we're going to think ahead because in the long run, we're stuck with this person one way or another. We're not stuck with them all the time once we get divorced, but we got a parent with them. In the long run, we're really loving and concernful of our children. In the long run, we want this to be as short as possible. We don't want to be putting our lawyers' kids through college. We want to be putting our kids through college. In the long run, we want to minimize the amount of therapy everyone's going to need by being careful about what we do with our feelings. In the long run, we're going to want this divorce to be as short as possible, and maybe we can avoid the holidays together. So that's embracing change. If you want to embrace the change, if you want to get through the fear of change, the first thing you need to do is be ready to make a plan. And um, honestly, you can make that plan on your own. You can do the research on your own. There's plenty, plenty of resources out there. I would suggest that the things that you need for a plan, uh, you're going to want to know about the different kinds of law that are out there. We've got stuff here uh, on the Richard Relationship website, in our video blog, our blog post, and our podcast about the different kinds of divorce. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to know about the players. You're gonna to wanna to know how to move through this emotionally. And we've got a book uh, that's just being published called The Divorce Detox. I have a copy over there, but I'm not gonna jump out on my screen and show it to you. The Divorce Detox is a workbook that's gonna help you to move through the divorce from how to pick a lawyer right through to how to handle your feelings and be there for everyone. The Doors, it's a great workbook. It's our 12-week program summarized in one book. You're going to be looking for how long does a typical divorce take? You're going to be looking for all the resources that you need. And so whether you're going to reach out for a coach, a therapist, a lawyer, you want to get all those things lined up in advance before you pull out your bazooka, your handgun, or whatever it is you're gonna pull out. Or maybe you're just gonna push enter and get the program running, which would be a lot healthier than having a weapon, right? I, really what we're doing when we plan is we're writing the program for our divorce. This is where it's gonna start. These are the things that we need. If A, then this, if B, then that, if C, then that. Uh, and these are the, we're gonna have everything that we need for as that divorce moves through, what we can expect, who we need to work with, how much money do we need, and we're going to start to get ourselves together for that. And so before you start your divorce, as you move through that change, you want to get these ducks lined up. You want to know what the risk is to your children emotionally. You want to know what the risk is to your job. You want to know what the risk is to your friendships. I can tell you your friendships are going to definitely be stressed by this and probably go through some alterations. You're going to want to know how it's going to impact all the areas of your life, if at all possible. Research, research, research. All right, so let's talk about um, kids for a second. Wow, I keep going to kids, kids, kids. The healthiest divorce is going to be focused on the well-being of the children. And the reason is uh, when two people have been contentious for a long time, which is why they get divorced, if they can find one thing that they agree on as a guiding light that takes them through the process, they are going to surrender a lot of their reaction, their triggeredness, their anger, their blame to that higher value. And the higher value is the well-being of the children. And so 
getting clear on the well-being of the children is really the highest value. So let's talk about what does that mean right now? I mean, here it is. It's October as I'm recording this movie into November. Holidays are coming up. What's best for the kids? Is it best for the kids that you pull the trigger now and that they go through Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's knowing that mom and dad are breaking up? Probably not. Even though they know something's not right, even though you and dad or you and mom are in a tough space, it's probably better if you fake it till you make it until you get to January when the dust starts to settle on the holidays. Will the holidays be what you would like to expect them to be? Heck, no, right? We all have this expectation about the holidays that they're going to be amazing family times filled with joy and, you know, all that good stuff. You're going to walk into these holidays and your highest expectation is going to be that you and the other parent make it through so that the children come through it feeling happy, satisfied, and fulfilled and that you feel you've done your job. You're going to wear your parent hat, I don't have any hats here today, but you're gonna wear your parent hat in this experience. Uh, so you're gonna let go of, oh, I'm gonna have such a good time with my family. You're gonna let go of the joy of whatever holidays you celebrate, and you're gonna focus on, how am I doing for my kids today? That's gonna be the focus, is how am I gonna do for my kids? And while you're preparing yourself for these holidays, while you're preparing yourself to put on your best face, with your other parent. You're going to be researching. This is your research time from now through January 1st. You're gonna be researching lawyers. You're gonna be taught, when you pick a lawyer, you're gonna start researching what are the options that you have. When you, while you're, you're gonna be researching a network of support, you're gonna need a network of support. You're gonna be researching how you're gonna create safety for yourself once you do decide to start the program. So safety looks like physical safety. Where, is there a place where you can go where the other parent will not follow you? Because you're going to want space of your own. Um, it, it, it could be in the house that you're living in. It could be in a separate house. It could be at your mom's house. It could be at a friend's house. It could be an apartment. Whatever it is, you will want a place where when stuff comes up, you can say, I'm sorry. I'm upset right now. I need to take a time out and close the door. Vital and important. You're going to need space to set emotional boundaries with them, like I just demonstrated you know, what I, I'm so, when I, my I'm sorry statement. You are going to need to have, start really understanding why things didn't work between you. Not just that they are a narcissistic, self-centered, angry, bullying, uh, depressed, sad, dysfunctional, whatever you, they have going on, not just that stuff. But what made them that way? You're going to need to understand why they are the way they are. And the reason for that is, number one, you're going to want to have an empathetic connection to them, right? So that, so that when they spit at you, you can just wipe it off and go, that's not about me. They're, they just spit, right? And number two, you're going to want to understand how to communicate them in a way where they can receive it without triggering them. And number three, you're going to want to prepare your children for dealing with whatever's going on on the other side there that caused, the, caused you to want to divorce them, right? And so there's some dysfunction or some problem over there or whatever that you didn't like, and your children got to live with it. So you're going to want to be able to teach your children strategies for dealing with that stuff, not with them, right? You're not going to have a conversation with your children going, you know, your mom slash dad is such a blah, 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 blah. Instead, you're going to say, son slash daughter, I'm being as generic as possible here. There are people in the world who get, who really only think of themselves. And, you know, it's just a part of life. And here's how we deal with it in this family. And the value of that conversation is not only will they learn how to deal with the dysfunction in the other household, but there are plenty of people just like the person you're married to. Guess what? They're not a unique dysfunctional person. There are all kinds of broken people here on the face of the earth that your children are going to come encounter with and that they're going to learn how to deal with from you. And last of all, you probably want to make sure that you have as much input as possible while you're doing these things. That's all part of making sure that you have that space, that you have that going on. That's all part of getting ready to take, to move those children through the process. You also are going to want to charge your own battery because if you're going to show up for your kids, you got to make sure you're 100% charged. So 
whatever you're doing about sleep, food, exercise, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, you're going to want to ramp that up times 10. These are all, and you're going to, this is all part of your plan. All right, let's move on to the next piece. So we talked about change. We talked about dealing with change. We talked about the children. We talked about keeping things as normal as possible for the children. When the time comes, and by the way, when the time comes to talk to the children about it, just remember that it's not, that you and the other parent love them and it's not their fault. That's like the party line. You don't need to give them deep explanations. It's not working anymore. We both love you. It's not your fault. And we've got a checklist uh, talk to your child checklist you can get. Check out our website. It's up there. We've got all kinds of resources on to help you with that really uncomfortable conversation. Let's talk about friends and work and managing that. Um, another reason why you might want to wait until after New Year's and why a lot of people do wait till after New Year's is you want to make sure that as you move into this time of change that there's minimal impact from other things. So you'll probably want to clear the deck at work. A lot of people don't tell anyone about what's going on at home. It, depending on your, excuse me, your work situation, you may want to let your employer, if, you, if you're not self-employed, know upfront what's going on and let them know that you are committed to being as productive as possible uh, and that you're going to do your best to not let what's going on interfere with work and that you may need some flexibility as your circumstances change. You want to enroll them in the idea that you are a deeply committed employee who honors and upholds the commitments they take on, particularly in the workspace. And your request is that as you go through this period of change, you know, could you have some possibly some flexibility of scheduling? Because what's going to come up is all of your systems for running your child's lives are gonna fall apart once the divorce begins. And so you may be dropping off and picking up whereas they were dropping off and picking up, or you may be taking the doctor's appointments or whatever. And so you're gonna to need to make sure that your work is aligned behind you. You wanna make sure your work is aligned behind you. You might wanna to talk to your friends about this also. And let me tell you that friends don't handle divorce well. Sometimes they're afraid they're gonna catch it from you. And you might wanna have a frank conversation with them. You might just wanna say, as you get closer to pushing start on the program, you might want to say to them, you know, uh, Elaritha and I are getting divorced and uh, I just wanted you to know about it. And if you need some distance from me, I understand, but I hope that when it's all over, we can resume our friendship. Or if you would like to be in my corner or our corner, if you don't want to take sides while we're going through this, I understand and I appreciate that as well. But know that you have permission to step out for a while if you need to, or if you can uh, and you know something about it and you want to help me with it, be there with me. It's really important that we give our friends permission to choose because they're going to have a lot of anxiety about that situation. Work, friends, am I missing anything else? Change we touched. I think I touched on everything. Children, of course. Ah, family. This is something really important to remember the extended family, your partner's family and your family. You're gonna to wanna to work with a vision for success, right? Like in 10 years, you and your partner have been divorced for 10 years and what's the relationship that your children have with their family and with your family? And what do you want it to be? And if you want it to be that, you may want to talk about with your other parent how you're gonna break it to the family and what your position is going to be together, if they'll permit it. If that's, in, if, if that's in their realm of possibility, they may be very emotionally distraught if they're caught off guard. But you're going to want to plan for extended family. Um, I've worked with couples where there was a lot of disturbance, where uh, one partner's family was really angry with the other, even threatened them with physical violence, which was a huge mistake in terms of their relationship with the children. And also, um, you know, years later, the well, dust is going to settle and there's going to be at least a cordial relationship. And so you want to do the best that you can with extended family. And don't be surprised if they take sides. And don't be surprised if they name call. And probably the best thing you can do in those situations is instead of arguing, you can simply say something like, you know, your child and I made a commitment to each other and 
I wasn't able to keep that commitment, and I re regret that, but this is the best decision for all of us. I feel this is the best decision for all of us. And if you're angry or sad or hurt, I understand completely. I forgive you, and I ask you to forgive me. That's probably the highest stand you can take with uh, the other parents' parents, the other parents' family, is to own that no matter how evil or awful the other parent has been, that you are breaking a commitment to them, the commitment of marriage, you have your good reasons, you know, but you don't need to go over them. You don't need to justify yourself. You just need to say, yes, I'm breaking the commitment and I don't like breaking my commitments and it's an, my commitments are important and I feel this is the best choice for all of us. You don't need to explain why it's the best choice. I may be wrong, but it's just, this is what I believe. Right? And I forgive you for being upset with me and I hope that you can forgive me. It's really simple. And that's where we want to be in the end. So when do you want to get divorced? You want to get divorced when you have worked through all the things that you are scared of that are keeping you from initiating the change. You want to work through uh, what's the course of the divorce going to be? What's your professional support going to be? What's your emotional support going to be? What's the impact going to be on your children, on the other parent? You want to have a vision uh, for the future. You want to make sure that your work is in alignment with that vision, that your friends are in alignment with that vision, that your extended family are in alignment. And what I mean by alignment is as close to supporting you as possible. Alignment might be that you present it to them and they go, no, you might go to your work and say this. They might go, oh, that's no, sorry. you got to work these hours. And what that will tell you is maybe I need to get another job. Right? So you want to make sure that you have an understanding of where you stand with everyone before you actually hit start on that program. And you want to do it at a time where you have the least possible disturbance, which is why so many people wait till January. Don't just wait till January. By the way, do not just wait till January because you feel like the holidays are important. Wait till January because your kids are important. The holidays are an important time for them. And you're going to use that time to consult with people who understand this problem. You're going to use that time to develop your network of support. You're going to use that time to prepare yourself for a marathon. Because divorce is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And you want to prepare yourself for it. As always, if you have any questions... Rich at richinrelationship.com or just go to richinrelationship.com. We have a ton of resources for you there. And we'll list some of the resources that I talked about today in the notes if you're on the podcast or the video blog. And if you're on Facebook, uh, you can direct message me or post some questions under this video and we'll respond. Thank you so much.